All right. Michelle, it's only one after, or now it's two after. Do we have folks coming in still? I was like, when I first looked down and we were talking, I was a 13. Thank goodness we're up to 40 now. <laughs> 41 and counting. We'll get, to the 50, we'll get into the 50s, I'm sure. All right, we're going to hold off, Jim. Let's let's email the base, and we're not going to start until 50 or year. Yes. We got like 60 last time, so we should be we should be good. Yeah, I was on a webinar yesterday uh, we did with IT Glue, and uh, we had like 20 people come in at, at like 5 to 10 after, so. Oh, wow. It was a big webinar. It was like 300 people. But those five to ten were the game changers. Those are the those are the important ones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Michelle, should I kick kick it off here? I think I think we should. We've got a lot to cover today. So. All right, fantastic. All right, so yeah, we have two very special guests today. Uh, one is on right now, Gary Pika and Stanley Schniz in the background. So we actually have three special guests. Yeah. Um. And at the bottom of the hour, we're actually going to have Phyllis Lee from Center for Internet Security, CIS, come on. We're going to be talking about the uh, M365 benchmarks. Jim and Chip, I believe, spoke with them this week, correct, Jim? We did. We had a very productive conversation with the folks, with Phyllis and, and uh, folks over at CIS. So, awesome. Good stuff. Good, good. Um, and so just a uh, quick quick kind of I'll, I'll start things off we'll go um over to amanda we have a few fortify updates and then gary and i'll talk about a few things i've got uh, some talking points here we're gonna uh walk through but um did want to just kind of ask everybody um if if you have something uh just from a um sharing perspective if we could go with a hand raise um also try to you know space out between people who are uh, participating. If you if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. We want to make sure everybody in the community gets a chance to, you know, voice their opinion and say something. Um, so yeah, so we'll keep an eye out for Michelle. If you could keep an eye out for hand raises, let's use that as our best means of um, sharing ideas. And then uh, if 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 it, things start to go over an extended period of time, I'll, I might jump in and just to keep things moving along in the call. All right, so with that, Michelle, I'll stop sharing. Um, is Amanda here? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Heard her. So it is a Fortify update, but by way of, um, or a new report. So we wanted to show you guys what the next report will be and sort of just get everyone's feedback. So hopefully you can see my screen that says threat mitigation report now. Yeah, that's gonna Excellent. So this report's gonna be based off of organization and it'll have a start and end date that you can plug in so you can get data for a specific time range. This report is meant for you to use with the MSP once you've had Fortify connected and you've been monitoring for a little while and you have some data that you wanna show them and you wanna have the conversation about why it's important to keep the Fortify and SAS alerts going. So once you've picked your organization and your date range and you've run the report, you're going to be presented with three sections in this report. The first section is going to be the prevent section, and this is where your Fortify information is going to display. So you're going to start with your sec secure score in the first box here. It's going to have an indicator of where the org started when you first connected it. So if it was down at 20, if it was up at 50, wherever that initial spot was, that'll be what you see first. And then the next line will be where they currently are at. So you can show where you've taken them to. <clears throat> Next to that, there'll also be a trend line to show you as well for that duration of the time report that you've sent, how their score is improved. Um, we are considering with this light gray, some other benchmark type data to put in. Not exactly 100% sure what that'll be given we're just collecting that benchmark data now. So this graph will most likely have a couple of iterations to it, but the, the purpose is to show you the trend scale and be able to compare with some other data points. And then lastly, in this section, what we're going to show are the recommended actions that have been completed, mitigated, and or accepted. And so you'll get the name of the action, you'll get the score impact, you'll get when it was completed and how it was completed. So whether or not you actually applied it or mitigated it, as well as some additional notes. You know, So in the case of if you're using a third-party application and you've indicated that and selected the mitigated, 
item, you'll be able to reference while you're talking to your customer what it is you're using in order to meet that qualification. We will be adding the CIS element mapping, um, but that's a to be determined kind of thing once we know what that data point looks like, so I don't have a rendering of it just yet. The next section is the monitor section. So we're gonna pull in here the account logins and events map. So this is the same as the cyber um, security report as well. And so this is gonna be able to paint the picture of, we've gotten you to this point with Fortify and securing and applying all these actions and improved your score. But even with all of that done, right? You still have this many logins happening, this many from outside approved locations, this many critical alerts, et cetera, to paint the picture that there's still threats that are happening daily to this organization. And then when you scroll to the bottom of the report, you're gonna be in the react section. So I've secured you as best as I can to prevent things with Fortify. I'm monitoring and I know where the attacks are coming from. And then I'm using respond to react to those events if something does actually happen. So here's, you're gonna have your list of the respond rules that are active on that org. And it's gonna tell them exactly the rule name, what's what it's doing, how often it's doing and what it's doing in order to prevent further um, possible actions from being taken place. <clears throat> so that is the report, just looking for general feedback if anybody has any comments. Um, Ryan Thompson loves it. Can you ingest the 2FA status or grab that the 2FA status from Office 365? Um, so I'm actually not the person to answer that question, but I will take the note. Um, what I'm doing here in this report is actually pulling whatever has been entered into Fortify. So if you've entered into Fortify, it carries over into Microsoft. I'm not 100% sure um, what we're pulling back into Fortify. I know if it's done prior to setting up Fortify, we will pull that in and say that it was done prior to us having set up Fortify. Chip, you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, so we already do have um, a 2FA report for both Microsoft and Google Workspace tenants that is built into the report section of SAS alerts. Um, you know, it, it predates the whole Fortify project, actually, and um, that report's been available to, to all partners, uh, I don't know, for, I think, a year or more. Um, so I don't know if there's value in adding it to this particular segment, but I, if that's if the if that is the question, like could we add it here? Yeah, we could. Well, I yes, just noticed that you say you know mitigated using Duo to monitor. I just I was just wondering if if you could pull it it if you could pull that, but that's right. So this is just an example of the actions completed in Fortify and the status that you've mon like that you've set for Fortify. The MFA, like Chip said, we have a separate report, and that's actually included in our first Fortify report and the Org Vulnerability Assessment Report. At the very bottom, the MFA is there next to the major risks in the satisfactory. Um, so we have it in several places. I, I, the, think I, the, I think the idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you want to make sure if there's a compensating control that that's added in here because you're using a different solution. Yeah. So yeah. in... Thank you, Andrew. And just to follow up on that, right? So in Fortify today, you can actually select alternative mitigation duo, right? Excellent example. So I think what we want to do on, on, on our side when we build this is that is an action that you've taken that is outside of Microsoft to protect your customer. And if that's the case and you've told Fortify or and, and as a result, the Microsoft tenant, hey, we're using duo to handle this particular recommended action that is something that we should make sure to show on this report um, as well. I would also ask you guys, right? So like this table that we're looking at is showing us the recommended actions that you've implemented with Fortify. And I think we should add to that, thanks to your feedback, that you have alternative mitigation using Duo to monitor as is shown in row two of this table. And then thirdly, I would also ask if you have a customer, right? This would never happen to anyone on this call, but you have a customer who refuses MFA and you have a whole bunch of MFA recommended actions. And uh, you have a whole bunch of 
MFA recommended actions, one of the options that we have and that connects to Microsoft is risk accepted. And so we always recommend here, if you're going to go with the no MFA route, protect yourself, get some legalese to protect yourself to do that. Um, so the question is, should we show that on here to say, um, this one is risk accepted as is shown in the third row here. Right. So, so sorry. So the original question that I thought was asked was if you've already mentioned to Microsoft that you're using Duo, do we pull it into Fortify? And so that's where I was saying this report is simply showing what you've already tagged done in, in Fortify. Okay. Let's take Andy's question then, Andrew, let's, let's get to Gary. The quick question is, can we have a section that says, if you bought this license from Microsoft or used our solution stack to address these um, issues, these would address, uh, these are the recommended additional pieces that you need. And to be able to um, have put that information in SAS Alert so that we could include that in a report like this. In other words, hey, you need Defender license or you need uh, a P1 license or you, you need- Yes. Something so, else. So Andy, have have you taken a look at the org vulnerability assessment report yet? That was the first one that came out with Fortify. So that shows you if you're at your current licensing, what you can do. And then if you upgrade to Defender, if you upgrade to P1, whatever level you're at, it then shows the next levels up and it shows you how much you can increase your score. It's, it's little like wheels that show you that in the org vulner vulnerability assessment report. Seeing this is a prospecting report tool. And that's why I was asking for that. So the org vulnerability is meant to be the prospecting tool. This okay. one is supposed to be because you're showing the trend scale and everything that you've done and completed for them. This is really to be that ongoing conversation piece with the one you're monitoring, like why it's still important that you keep going with them and keep monitoring, keep adding things because this is what you've been able to do for them to date. Okay, thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for feedback. If people have you know, specific suggestions or requests. So we do have the community feedback. Uh, you can reach out to your account manager. Um, more than happy to, you know, take all your requests um, on the functionality piece. I love so, anything. You're all that, like everything with longitudinal data. I love it's super sticky and gives people a different perspective compared to point in time. So kudos on that. Exactly. One of the things that we talk about Gary a lot is like, you know, as an MSP, we provide you with a key. The other key is the customer, right? They, they have, they also have a key together. You can basically turn them at the same time and unlock essentially everything that's going on in the environment, whether it's be, you know, DLP or, you know, things around, you know, like these scores. And it makes people want to continue to have the conversation with you as opposed to basically ignoring your BCIO requests on a go forward basis. I remember back in my MSP days, like after the first two BCIO visits, you couldn't get people to take the calls anymore because all we talked about was how many viruses we quarantined. Yeah. And that's a one way conversation, right? Like yeah. we're allowing for two way conversations here. Really good. So Gary, yes. as we try to as we transition over to you, I just have a question and then I'll I'll back up. I, I think everybody knows you, but I'll ask you to intro you in, in, in two seconds. But Gary, when you see a report like that, right? Positioning, is it quarter, to, is it QBRs? Is it to be sent on a recurring basis via email? Like what, any recommendations or thoughts on where you're going to get your best bang for your buck? You know, because you mentioned you love those longitudinal reports. I, I do. And, and, and listen, uh, the, I don't think there's one right answer for it. I think it depends on I, I, not only what your cadence is. Like if you're seeing, if you're sitting face to face or Zoom with a customer once a quarter, you got to find other things in between that are valuable and decide what those things are. It also depends on the accounts. Like MSPs are dealing with larger, more complex accounts where some meetings are, you, this wouldn't be appropriate. There'd be a second meeting where you're meeting with someone else to review these kind of things. So I, I just think you need to be thoughtful about it, Andrew. Look at your accounts, put them in categories, decide what the touch points are and why they're valuable to the customer, and then have a playbook to inspect that that's happening uh, on a regular basis because proactive things are easy to set aside. 
Yeah, and I think from a prospecting thing, I'll just close with this, Gary. I think when, whether it's a client or or your or your you know your warm two fifty, as you like to say, Gary. I think it's really important to keep your pulse on what's happening. Let's just take MGM as an example. Now they're a huge corporation. Most companies aren't dealing with companies that size. But my point is, what verticals are you serving so that if there is a threat actor targeting them and it is social engineering and your customer has chosen to not do certain mitigating controls that you've advised, right? That's a perfect way, Gary, to maybe create something say, Hey, by the way, did you know this just happened in your industry? Yeah. And, and, if, you're, and if you're not doing that, Andrew, I mean, look, it comes up right on the, on the cyber call every week, something else comes up. And so to me, if you're an MSP today, in any role, but definitely a leader or a VCIO, you have to be ingrained into what's happening with cybersecurity trends. And you should be using them in almost all, they're the third parties are the best conversations. Hey, remember when I came out last week and we talked about, you know, uh, SAS alerts and the, and the, look, let me give you two more examples. Do you, do you understand where we are with this, that we can't protect you unless X, Y, Z happens? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're the best conversations uh, to have. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to talk about some of that today. Some of these wedges that I'm seeing yeah. that are amazing right now in, in our industry. Yeah, Gar, so we have uh, 50 or so people on. Again, I'm going to assume everybody knows you, but just real quick, in, in case anybody does not know you, can you give a, a Reader's Digest real quick? Yeah, so I'm Gary Pika. I'm the founder of True Methods. I have... Um, Prior to building True Methods, which is training peer, and we built a software package, uh, the first fully functional VCIO uh, software platform called My IT Process. And before and during that, I owned and scaled and exited two high-performing MSPs. Um, today, uh, our peer groups, True Peer, we have 450 MSPs that we work with, you know, on a quarterly basis to help change their business and change their life. So, very cool. All right. So Gary, you've been my friend uh, for 20 years, but uh, co-host on the cyber call since we started for about three now. We were at around 160 sessions. Um, we've had the who's who of cyber folks on uh, and business leaders in, the, in our space in cybersecurity. One of the things you probably say almost every show is that sounds expensive. Um, for those that haven't been on why does that theme keep coming up and why is it important for MSPs on this call to understand what you mean by that? Because almost every week on the cyber call, there is another category, whether it's a tool, a process, things we need. Last week it was, we're realizing we have to have some cost attached to vendor management came up last week. Right. That's not something we bundle into our, you know, we bundle into our costs in any way. So it seems like every week, there's somebody coming on who's an expert and something comes up that's really important that all MSPs should be doing for their customers. Like, yeah, that sounds expensive. Like, <laughs> like we have to pay for this. We, we're not like, if I uh, am the IT director for a company with a thousand employees and I have to do something or buy something, I get, just have to go to the board or my boss and get budget and then we do it. Our board is 60 customers. We got to go to all 60 customers and explain the value to them to be able to, to, to be able to do these kind of things. That's why you really have to choose widely or wisely, Andrew. I mean, if you look at it and, and SAS alerts is probably the perfect example, something that is inexpensive and covers checks a lot of in other words checks a lot of boxes in terms of covering a, you know a major like major threat area and is easy to implement they're the kind of things we have to prioritize because some of the other great solutions and things we have to do require you know a more significant change in process they require tools that cost four five six eight ten dollars a user that's a major commercial change for an MSP, man. If we won 70% gross margins, every dollar of seat cost is $3.33 of seat price. So something that's eight or 10 bucks. I was talking to a startup the other day 
And they had a good idea. And I said, well, what's the price? And I said, and they said like six or $7 per user. And I said, you realize that's going to be one of their top four most expensive seat. Like, how are you going to deal with that? Unfortunately, there wasn't a great, you know, there wasn't a great, you know, answer uh, coming back on it. But that's how we have to think. We can't do everything right now as MSPs. We don't have the time, money, energy, and we can't evolve. So we have to really be thoughtful in how we prioritize every dollar of seat cost, whether it's labor or tools, to get the maximum impact. And from a security standpoint, maximum coverage. We're not going to get to 100%. What's the easiest, most cost-effective, most value-driven way to get to 85%? Yeah. Really Does that makes, make sense? No, no, it makes a ton of sense. And one of the things you you know you teach and talk a lot about is you know implementing a new solution. Can you just you know you talked about C costs, really more hard cogs. I heard you say labor, but can you just en enlighten everybody, Gary? Like, hey, I'm gonna in I'm gonna embark on this hypothetically this zero trust solution. I'm just picking something out of thin air. That's a good one. Yeah. Can you just walk people through of why it takes five, eight or so implementations of losing money just to start to get on the fairway? Like, what is that cost and the alignment of roles and noise? Can you can you kind of frame that out for people that they don't often take into consideration when they're like, oh, that's cool. That's a cool tool. It looks great. What's all the stuff behind it? Yeah, so the tool might be four or five dollars a seat, which is which is not insignificant, right? Um, but then people buy it, they roll it out to their customer base, and all of a sudden they're realizing, wait a minute, this throws off some noise. To get this to work, it takes effort on our part. I mean, zero trust. I've seen people tr implement that and like get to the point where they're saying, like, hey, I got a full time person now involved uh, with this. And they didn't calculate in that into their seat cost. And it's a specialized sales set. And they have to be able to cross train. I mean, there are so many things that impact it. That's why you have to choose widely, wisely. Then you have to roll things out in a way where you learn first and really understand all of your costs before you determine what the value and price will be for that and and roll it out operationally to the rest of your customers. Got it. So um and then multiply that by 30 or 40 tools everybody has now. 40 yeah. 45 tools, right? It's a lot. <laughs> and so our conversation about vendor management and and I see Eric Woodard's on who's got a great perspective on this. But um and, and I won't digress Gary, but it's just interesting how we've gone from you know when you and I first were in this industry of you know 203 204 and there were a few tools. The average now is around 40. And most folks, um, and Eric Woodard probably can throw it in the chat, don't read right their their contracts and 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 they're signing away. And often that's not a good thing. So you have to also take that whole piece into consideration there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have to think about like we're in between vendors. And, and customers, software vendors for sure, but there's a lot of other vendors, some of them that have access to our customers. We're outsourcing some knock services. We're outsourcing, you know, some, we have some help desk that's overseas. Like these are high risk areas and the relationship, the safeguards, and then the contractual agreements, Andrew, we can't, we have to be mature now. We can't not do it that way. Same thing with our customers and the way we look at, you know, what our master service agreement looks like. We have a lot of risk. I've seen more than one company, um, you know, have very negative effects uh, for some of these things. Sure. So with the viewpoint of 450, now, again, that's not taking into consideration your kind of, you know, your True Methods membership would be yeah. far over a thousand um msps but in looking at their numbers quarterly um what is the difference between average and world class um in terms of numbers but what is it operationally what is it from business acumen what's been the difference that you've seen in coaching over the last probably 10 years directly in peer so it, they almost fit together so i'll look i i look at a lot of things like 
when I look at an MSP, you know, I want to look at their profitability and their growth. That tells me a lot about them. Then I want to go and see what their revenue distribution is and what their average seat cost is. And normally the ones that are best in class on those things, Andrew, almost every time they have a level of business maturity, command over the business. They understand the cost drivers, right? They're growing. And now they're the ones taking advantage of the current marketplace. And when I say the current marketplace, there has never been, I've been doing this 25 years. I've sold millions of dollars personally of recurring revenue as an MSP. There has never been an environment to sell more recurring revenue at, at the highest price. Like it's crazy. And there's so many more prospects. Mm -hmm. And so, but to do it, you have to A, have command really know what your cost drivers are and be able to show value to existing customers as well as new customers. Like if you haven't figured out how to weaponize your competitor's low price, you're coming from behind. And now as you mature, you have access to a whole new market of co-managed. Uh, Jim, you and I are doing a session at Datocon about uh, co-managed IT. Andrew, we're seeing this really as one of the biggest waves we're seeing as we watch the numbers because we track that revenue you know separately but you can't get there unless you have a you know a, a level of, of maturity it starts with business then it's operational then it's security usually in that order yeah absolutely it, it's interesting you and i've talked a lot about this you also see um the most mature organizations in terms of sales process because talk to us about the relationship of discipline right with you see really good sales process really good price per seat and then you typically see those organizations the most mature in security why is there that correlation yeah because step one is having business maturity having command over the business where you have a business planning process you're able to push messaging down, have, you know, no quarterly, what your top rocks are in all areas, put instrumentation in place, sales, operations, finance in every way. Like that's what it takes to get there. So when people get there, very rarely is there an awesome sales organization and a really immature operation. I, I, I can't say it never happens, but that's really rare because the same leadership team, once you think in that way, you think in that way about all areas of the business. Yeah, it's 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 interesting over the course of, again, being in this 20 years, you mm -hmm. having a war on me, um, but how sophisticated, right, Gary, these businesses are becoming, especially with PE behind everything too. Is that fair? Oh, yeah. So I, in, in addition, you know, I sit on a couple boards, private equity backed, you know, MSP. So I get that view. And there's a bunch of them now. And I won't even see just PE back. There are some, I'm saying MSPs that have gotten above that, you know, $15 million, you know, with still growth and profitability. I put them all in the same category. Um, they look at the business completely differently, right? Um, Jim and I were just talking about some of the ones that we know together. They look at something like SAS alerts and, you know, <laughs> They, they have a model and a confidence to be able to go out and just install it at all their customers and send, you know, bundle it with one or two other services and saying, hey, here's what we just installed. It's another, you know, $4 a seat. And after 90 days, here's your opt out. And they're getting 2% opt out and they're creating hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of, e of EBITDA with no sales cost. Like this is who we're competing against now, Andrew. Well, Rob, yeah. so- Andy, yeah, can I just yeah. dovetail on that and yeah. ask a, a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. So, Gary, you know, for the sake of everyone else, like you and I had this conversation yesterday, you know, because I had the conversation with the CEO of a large MSP that you and I both know on Monday, and he thanked me. He said, Jim, thank you for essentially telling us what we should do with SAS alerts in terms of the coverage extension notification, putting out everybody charging, you know, they're, they're, they're literally going to increase their, their annual recurring revenue by $2.4 million this year with their SaaS initiative. But then I get on a call today with an MSP that have got 500 users. And I tell them this story. And by the way, this has now happened 
I've had that same conversation I had on Monday with large MSPs with probably 40 MSPs over the last year, right? That have all done extremely well by just covering their base and basically making people opt out, which is only a 3% opt out rate. I tell that story and they're like, yeah, but you know, uh, I just, I don't, I, I don't think our customers will go for that. Ugh. I can't even, how many times does this have to play out with so many other MSPs before the MS, that 500 person MSP that I'm talking to right now actually gets it? I don't know, but hearing that enough times almost pushed me into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> honestly like my head's ready to explode so here I, there's one message andrew that i want to get through today that dovetails on this if there's one thing i want to share we are pushing people not to raise price to raise value price follows along with value to understand what those motions are with your current customer base to focus on that motion of what are we going to go out? How are we going to do it? How do we set expectations that this is going to happen again within the next year and why? Everyone who does it has success. Without exception, they come back and the only thing they say is, I wish I would have listened to you sooner, Gar. No one ever came back and said, hey, we had a value conversation with all of our customers and no one got it, and no one bought, and two people got mad at me. That's never happened one time, ever. Yet, it is so hard to get, Jim, to your point, for someone to say, I can't do this. I'm like, well, I know five other people in your marketplace that have already done it. And they have the same kind of customers. And here's yeah. what they pay, because they perceive value this way. Don't forget that we are as MSPs are a very small cost to our customers as a percentage of their other costs, of their profit and of their revenue. We're small. Whether they pay us $4,000 or $5,000 isn't even a rounding error. It, this issue of value is all us. Now we have work to do. We have to be operationally mature. We have to make sure that we have you know, dedicated roles and process so that we can easily explain the value to people. We have to be educated about what's happening right in the marketplace so we can use third-party stories. We have work to do, but everyone can do that work, Jim, and everyone can get the same seat prices as top MSPs in the you know, 200 to 300 seat range. Everyone can do it. I totally agree with you, Gary. I just... You're the MSP legend. You, you're the MSP whisperer, right? You've, you've worked with so many over the years. I was hoping that you could actually answer that for me because it's driving me insane. I had another call today with one of our really large partners. They're renewing with us for another three years, right? For 40,000 users. I'll tell that story today at a five o'clock call I have with a group of about 10 MSPs. And I guarantee you three, four, five of them are going to say, well, no, my customers, they wouldn't go for that. No, you should talk yeah. to my my peer onboarding person. She'll tell you what she what, what she deals with. Look, let me take that, Andrew. Do I have time for a quick story? Of course. Okay, so I I live in South Jersey, right outside Philadelphia. I went to speak at a Kaseya local event in Philadelphia, and I was talking about pricing. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, "Hey, I'm located here." Between the two MSPs that I owned, literally seven miles as the crow flies, right? And said, listen, I heard what you said, but in my market, we're already considered expensive. And my customers already complain about our price. I don't think you can get those prices. And I'm like, dude, literally one MSP is four miles from here. We had 160 customers paying those. If that wasn't enough, there's my second MSP. They have 80 customers paying those prices. I have five other peer members that I know in this area. I don't know what to tell you. And the thing is, Jim, what do you do when someone is telling you something that's not possible? That, that like That's not my opinion. I'm not saying like my opinion is it's possible. I'm saying that's my observation. Right. It's that's fact, my, not my, opinion. My personal experience. Yeah. Fact, not opinion. It's happening. You're yeah. just you're just getting in your own way. That's the that's that's the issue. You're getting your paradigms are getting in your own way of having a more successful business. But the difference is in you know five years ago there was people like that too, 
they just grew slower and didn't make as much money. Today, the market's changing so fast. If you're 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 losing out on opportunity, not just for yourself, but for your team, you're not securing your customers. You tell me your seed price, I'll tell you whether your customer is secure. And I don't care what you say because I know the math. Okay. I know what support costs. I know what tools cost. I know what proactive services cost. I know what VCIO costs per seat. And there's no way you can circumvent that math. Like that's the reality of it. So the stakes are much higher in this conversation, Jim, than they were even three years ago. Really good stuff. Yeah. I, I, and I think Gary, this, the lesson here and welcome, Phyllis, and love for you to chime in here, too, at any point, and we'll, we'll flip over to you. But, Gary, the lesson here is this is, you know, th there's a psychology that we all have to, I think, look in the mirror, like at all point, all pieces of our, not to get philosophical, but all pieces of our life, right? This came down, I remember the day I started working for you uh, at True Methods, and I remember starting to hear you say, look, um, you know, this is about you know, what, how you view yourself, right? Your self-image and self-discipline, it was way less about technology. Um, and the people that listened to you and said, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to look at myself and, you know, like maybe just close us out with that, that we live in a business where the majority of us, again, are the e-myth entrepreneurs that were technical people that became business owners. And we don't see ourselves in the light that a lot of the, the, the leaders do. And, 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 but that's, we can change that fair. Yeah, absolutely. When I first got in this business, I thought I just was going to record a bunch of videos, tell everybody exactly what to do to build a company like I built and everyone would do it. When that didn't happen, I was like, well, wait, what's it, why isn't everyone doing it? And in the beginning with our first peer members, I got mad. They, they teased me and said, I used to come to the meeting with a flamethrower, you know, but then over time, what I realized, Andrew, it doesn't, it wasn't that they didn't, that they weren't trying to do it. Their self-image would not allow them to move things like this, like price objections and what they were worth and what their services were, would not allow them to move it out of the way. And as I build peer, that's really what we do. We help people help each other change their expectations about what's possible. It's just that I'm more impatient about it today because this historically is probably one of the best addressable markets that we landed in, maybe in the history of economy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I'm it's, saying it's, let's go, people. Yeah, it, it, it's it's staggering, you know, again, it's, and, and Phyllis, welcome back. You know, we we are seeing, you know, I remember like we, we'd be like in awe, like again, seven years ago, yeah, or 10 years ago, like 175 a seed and like, whoa, that's a leader and 225 per person, you know, in terms of service revenue. And we are seeing day in and day out, 350 and 400. Yeah. And again, the same- On bigger deals. I just saw a deal come across one of my peer members, 100 users, 300 bucks a seed. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it's, it is, it, we now know- um, that there's people that can run the four minute mile. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good analogy. <laughs> awesome. Gary, stay with us. Um, cause our, your co-host of the cyber call is here. Phyllis Lee. Phyllis, welcome. Hello. Let me introduce myself real quick for those of you who don't know me. Um, my name is Phyllis Lee. I work over at the center for internet security. Um, and so my current position is the head of content development. And so that means the CIS critical security controls, um, the CIS benchmarks, which are secure configuration guides, as well as our cloud team, um, which we offer hardened images of our benchmarks um, fall under me. And so I just wanna say, I love this conversation. Um, I love being on the cyber call. I love being a part of this community and what I'm hearing and what I remember, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the gentleman's name was on the cyber call. We are having this exact same conversation, which comes up often. And, um, you know, he's very successful and, and, and is charging, you know, what I, I think what Gary Pico would say is the right rate. And, and, and everyone asked like, what, what got you there? What's the most important thing? And you know, what I thought was really amazing. He said, you have to know your guiding principles. Hmm. And so as an MSP, he goes in and says, um, I'm not going to let 
the customer decide what my what I what my offerings are, what I'm willing to do, what I'm willing to accept. I'm going to decide what I'm willing mm-hmm. to accept, right? And then and then that's how he moves forward and that's how he runs his business. And and I think that's what I'm hearing from you all and it's just so impressive and even you know creating the controls, creating the benchmarks, we have to have guiding principles as well, right? Because everyone has their favorite um security control, there's always strong personalities, there's always competing um, you know, efforts and, and things like that. And you have to kind of stand true to your guiding principles, I guess, in, you know, whatever your business may be so that um, you can move forward and say, okay, this is what we're standing behind. And everyone understands it, you know? And if you move forward, you have those principles, you're consistent. People will, res- I think they will, will respect it and accept, um, you know, uh, what you're offering. Yeah. Yeah, you typically, you don't, you know, it's interesting, Um Phyllis, we're going to get it right into last thing I'll say about this. You typically like if you brought in like a really, you know, a, a world class attorney, right, on some issue, and they're like, "Hey, you know, here's what it's going to be. It's going to be six fifty an hour, and here's why." You know, like they, they don't sit there and defend why it's six fifty an hour. They just say it's six fifty an hour, and if you want the the best results, you're going to hire me. Right. You can hire this person over here at 325. Good luck. Right. No one so, tries to get the cheapest accountant. Right. right. <laughs> so some people on this call may know who like GLG is or Alpha Sites. You know, these companies that solicit feedback on software products and you know different industries. They you know reach out to me every once in a while to do these calls. And my rate, if I'm going to take the time to do it, is $1,000 for the hour. And people say, that seems like a lot of money for an hour. I'm like, you're not paying for the hour. I've been in this industry for 20 years. That's what you're paying for. And that's ultimately the same mentality that you as MSPs need to have as well in terms of the value people get, your customers get when they hire you. Mm-hmm. And Phyllis, you said what you said perfectly, um, you know, dovetail into Andrew. And one last question I have for Gary, because it comes back to, and I'm, I think everyone would be dying to know this answer, Gary. If you were, if you had another MSP, a third MSP today in Philly, what would you, knowing all the costs that are out there and what you need to do to run your business successfully, what would be your all in C price? So, the average prop would definitely be above three hundred dollars. Yeah, I, I don't know how else. And when I say average, there may be you know a base fee in the two fifty to three hundred range. Maybe for some customers with more compliance needs, that there would be an add on you know bundle. Um, but when you average that all out and target the target the customers, it would be above three hundred dollars. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It's just, there's too much to do. And and the funny thing is, Gar, if you did the math for a hundred employee company, right? Spending 30 grand a month, it's 360. Tell me hiring an IT and a security guy, they can do it less expensively and have the breadth and depth of coverage. Yeah. They can't. Right? They no, can't. they can't. I mean, I mean, we've always, we've always kind of had that story. But now it's easy for customers to understand it because of all the security, uh, you know, work that we do. They Mm -hmm. can't have all the specialists that we have. They'd have to hire four different people to work a few hours a week. Like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, quick question and promise last one. And then Phyllis, Chad asks, would you still be forcing standardization in terms of, you know, networks, devices, accounts, et cetera? Yeah, I, I would do that at any seat price. Yes. Absolutely. Cool. Phyllis, welcome. Um, I'm, I'm going to also ask, Chip, are you with us? Because I, I might lean on you a bit here. Um, Absolutely. Awesome. I'm just going to share out my screen uh, just to set the stage. Um, so, Phyllis, maybe just level set, if you could, for everybody. What is a CIS benchmark? Before we get into this, in what we, you know, kind of talk about you and Chip and Jim's conversation 
um, and talk a little about the, the 365 benchmark, why it's important. But give us a sense of, you know, why, you know, these short little vignette publications that CIS creates, uh, what, what they're about. And by the way, that was sarcasm. As you can see, it's 255 pages. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so um, sure. So one of the top things um, that any organization can do to defend against top threats is to have a secure configuration, right? And um, secure configurations can enforce many things to include MFA, strong password policy, um, turning on automated pa uh, patching, et cetera. So really having a secure configuration is um, top priority if you want to defend against top threats. CIS was founded on um, number one, having um, these secure configuration guides, which is what our benchmarks are. Everything at CIS, the guidance that we create is consensus based, meaning we have a community of um, SMEs or subject matter experts um, with which we meet on a regular basis to determine which are like the most important um, uh, recommendations that we should put inside a benchmark. Uh, so what's nice about, I would say, almost all of our Microsoft benchmarks is Microsoft works with us on these benchmarks. So we have our resident Microsoft SMEs helping us figure out like, is this feasible, not feasible, et cetera. Within most of the benchmarks, you'll have a level one and a level two. And a level one, um, are uh, high priority security recommendations that are not supposed to affect usability, but there's always like that tension between security and usability. And level two is for those organizations who feel you need a little more security or a lot more security, and it may affect your user experience. Um, Got it. Just keep those in mind. Of course, all the benchmarks, they map those configuration settings to the controls to say, hey, if you implement this, you can, you know, you're also um, helping to satisfy a control in CIS controls. Very cool. Chip, maybe can you just get us on the fairway a little bit? You know, you guys are doing a lot of this even before you added Fortify, right? In terms of alerting on, um, you know, as an example, MFA, identities, and things of that nature. Um, maybe just can you give us a sense of what stood out to you and what where do you think we can go with um, if, if we went down the path of, you know, secure configuration around M365? Andrew, I, I, I missed the first part of what you said. Can you repeat that again? Because either I dropped out or you dropped out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I was asking or making a statement and correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of what SAS alerts did out of the gate, even before Fortify, you guys are alerting on, right? In other words, things are around identity, uh, et cetera. Uh, does that make sense? That's That was the first part of the statement. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, and then in the conversation and as you're starting to, you know, uh, peel back the benchmark and talking to Phyllis, like what things stood out to you and, and, and what seemed to be intriguing about where this might be able to go? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, you know, from the very start, the purpose of SAS alerts was to provide um, initially monitoring and alerting. Um, and then that obviously developed into automated response. And those activities in and of themselves uh, qualify for NIST and CIS and other controls as activities that someone in an organization has to take, right? In fact, the whole genesis of the idea for SAS Alerts came from the fact that myself and our, our other co-founder, Seth, were running businesses that were all virtual and we had no method to prove that anyone was actually doing monitoring and management and remediation because there wasn't a tool, right? Like we, were, we didn't have someone to sit in front of the 365 admin console all day long or somebody to sit and respond to alerts. So there we go. Um, so for quite a while now, going back two years, we've, we've always built out kind of a manual mapping that we share with partners because they ask this question a lot. Okay, what is it? What does this particular event that you guys track that may or may not become an alert? How does that fall into the different frameworks that are out there? And we send them a, you know, a PDF that they can share with their customers. Um, when we engaged in the process of building Fortify, we began looking at CIS in particular, and mostly because of the feedback from this group and saying, you know what, 
you know, when you research into Microsoft and their own policy configurations that they've developed, um, they've been informed by CIS, and we know that we have Phyllis here, you know, to vouch for that, that there's a, a two-way partnership between Microsoft and CIS on developing these controls. So there's a, already a natural mapping just by the act of taking the actions that are coming from the secure score. Um, our long range intention here is to build those mappings directly in to SAS alerts um, to especially take the 60 um, controls that are built in the 365 hardening benchmarks and make them drop dead easy for you guys to apply across the board to all the customers. Really exciting. Phyllis, you know, you also have a, you know, what pe people may not know is you're also the home of the MSI SAC. Um, we won't get, get in depth, but just suffice it to say, CIS um, provides the threat, you know, the, the foundational, the, they're the home of all threat intelligence for the state, local, territorial, and tribal organizations in our country. Um, and so, Phyllis, you talk to a lot of the organizations, in fact, municipalities and that, that MSPs serve. Um, can you give some perspective when does does configuration around M365 come up? Do they struggle? Um, what are some of those conversations like? Yeah, sure. So yes, we have the MSISEC, the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And like you said, they offer um, threat intel, incident response and recovery, et cetera, to the SLTTs. Um, and so it's nice to have that operational arm where we actually get to talk with um, organizations who want to you know, understand what is cyber about, et cetera. And so, yes, everyone is moving to cloud. Um, everyone, um, and I will tell you what we tell those, those organizations is um, engage with your MSP. You know, uh, like you said, it's cheaper for these smaller organizations um, to have an MSP rather than um, employ them. Additionally, just another side note, a lot of feedback we get is, once these people get trained up and know how to run the network, they're gone <laughs> because they can make more money somewhere else. And there's a lot of issues with retention. And so we always say, yeah, hey, go to your local MSP. And what those organizations want really is the easy button, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to understand one of our benchmarks. They don't want to read a PDF. They just want to go to someone and know that that entity is a trusted entity and will implement the CIS benchmark proper, properly or can help them implement the controls properly. And then to verify over time that it stays in compliance. That's, That's right. That's right. Measure drift, make sure that we're in compliance. Um, because as you know, there's the reporting and no government at this point um, wants to be in a headline saying that um, services could not be met for any city, any hospital, any school, right? Because they were hit with I'll just throw out ransomware because that's, you know, always what we see in the news. And it's um, so so we are hearing from them, you know, just help us do it um, and and the least amount of pain possible. And, um, you know, and they do ask us, how much do you think it's going to cost? And we do try to say, you know, you're going to have to pay, um, you know, a, a good amount, but it will be cheaper than having in-house staff. So we said it today on the call. We also say that to um, our MSI SAC members. Yeah, really, really cool, fellas. Andrew, um, people have a security issue, and they would say, like, uh, you know, um, you know, we're looking at three vendors, and I would always say, hey, man, it's great. You know, you're you're going to be able to pick the best vendor with the right approach, and you're not going to really have to prioritize cost. And they would say, why does everyone cost the same? I'm like, no, we're twice as much, but you're just not going to have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good reminder. Over at the MSI SEC annual meeting. Um, we had Eric Woodard on, who I think is on this call, and a couple other folks um, to talk about how should you vet your MSP. That's another popular question, like, what is it that we should do to vet our MSP? And, you know, uh, the panel, not one person said price, other than if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. <laughs> it's right. not going to be cheap. You get what you pay for. Um, so That's actually a question. Phyllis, I know you're not necessarily from the MSP industry to start out with, but you made a huge impact in a very short period of time on a lot of people. What's your perspective on potential um, you know, MSP, MSPs needing to be certified, certifications essentially 
on a go forward base. Do you think that the industry at some point will MSPs will be needed to be certified, just like accountants and lawyers and so forth? So yeah. So I mean, not to plug you know, we are a nonprofit, we do have a controls accreditation. And, and the reason why we have that is because so many organizations ask us, who do you recommend? Mm -hmm. Who can help us with our controls implementation? Who, who can tell us what to do? And, and we don't have a list, really. And so um, that's why we created the controls accreditation. So we can just point people to the to the page, like here, here are the people who you should go to. So I will say, yes, I think that will um, help you out just because we often get asked that question. And additionally, what we are seeing more and more um, is uh, state legislation around either a safe harbor law for implementing a controls framework, um, meaning you can only get sued up to a certain amount. Um, if you implement and what we've what we're seeing are CIS controls or NIST, either the Dash 53 or the CSF, right? And so what we see organizations looking to is okay, they want to be protected. They either only want to get sued up to a certain amount or not get sued at all, depending on, on the law. And they are going um, to implement controls. We get a lot of contact information on that. And they want to know who should I go to? And so if you do have that accreditation, if you do have a certification, I think it only behooves you because then we can point to you. So regulation is coming at some point, you think? Um, I, I think it may be coming soon. Now, right now, the federal government is leaving it up to the states. And so that's why you say all this legislation, um, you know, being tossed around in the states. So at this point, we for sure, there's like four or five states, but we track it and there's like 14 more states who have um, who have legislation pending. So I just want to add, Phyllis, to your comment and tie it back to the whole conversation Gary just had with with the team. You know, that accreditation is worth pursuing if for no other reason than it adds extra validity to why you're an MSP that charges more than the competitor down the street. That's too good to be true. And Andrew, uh, I'll make one last statement, which is security doesn't get done by support. It doesn't get done by tools. It doesn't get done. It's not a project, although sometimes there's projects involved. If you're an MSP and you don't have at least a dedicated proactive role to the type of governance we're talking about, you're not doing it across all your customers. You can't. You can't. Nothing gets done without dedicated role, process, and accountability or instrumentation. Nothing happens. Good stuff. Uh, I'm just going to close out with uh, this. You know, Chad mentioned some uh, comment um, about uh, liability. I'm not so sure. You know, again, I'm not a lawyer. I'd love who Eric Tilds was on the case, but um, I think it's a lot less about the score and a lot le more about what's in your MSA and who's responsible for what um, than it is about saying we have a score here. Um, that's it's typically about the legality of your contractual agreements, not about you have a score. Um, so again, not trying to be sarcastic to you, Chad, but that's typically where the lawyers, uh, if there's an incident, that's the first place they're going to start pull up. Industry best effort. Yeah. Um, and, go ahead. And I was going to say, you know, um, because of legislation, we are talking about, and we're going to produce something. What does it mean to reasonably implement um you know, a controls framework so that you can defend yourself in a court of law. And the feedback that we've gotten, we have lawyers and judges um, helping us, is that, you know, as long as you document properly and as long as you can have a rationale. So for example, if implementing a, a, a control would bankrupt your business, that's good rationale to not implement that control, right? <laughs> like you're, you you can't work yourself out of business. So, so there's like this kind of um, like risk assessment that organizations can do, which we just talked about on Monday, should your MSP be doing a risk assessment, you know, for end organizations? And I think it was a resounding yes. So, Yeah. Bill, it's awesome having you on. And I think this is probably the first of a lot more we'll be hearing, Chip, over time and Jim, um, about CIS as you guys start to dig in more. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Good. Definitely. Jim, any closing comments? Gary, thank you so much for coming on. Phyllis, 
Thank awesome. you. Awesome. This is so uh, fun. I, uh, no, I'm just, I was really looking forward to this one. Uh, obviously Gary and I, you know, great friends and, uh, and Phyllis, you're my second you best me. friend. I know what he's going to say, go ahead. Say you're Ed Lippy. Yeah. My twin brother. So, <laughs> um, and Phyllis, thank you so much, not for just today, but everything you're doing for the, for the security community around MSPs. It's really, really valuable. And we really appreciate your support. Um, so, uh, Gary, enjoy the, the Eagles game tonight. Go birds. And, uh, Andrew, thank you as always. Another fantastic session. Pleasure. Great seeing everybody. Thanks everybody. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye everybody.